uh, as uh, most of you know that uh, we have been studying how the Bible created modern India, and a number of experts have written uh, very good papers. Some of them are very long papers. And uh, uh, um, Brother Prashant himself is uh, putting those papers together, which might take three volumes. Uh, to like Dr. Vinod Shah's paper on healthcare is almost 50 pages. Um, and I think that in the, uh, we haven't made final decisions, but it may be good to, while it needs to be expanded in a book by itself, uh, but in the main volume, we should probably have the full, full paper, uh, an edited version. So, um, we have all of that material, and therefore, a group in Oxford has invited me to uh, create a 10-part series, uh, which would be about 25 minutes each, or uh, 2,500 to 3,000 words. So we are writing it, and I've requested a group of people to help write. Uh, in the area where they have written the chapters, and I'm turning their material in with an apologetic angle uh, uh, into these scripts. So uh, Dr. Alexander helped put together this first script, um, or the first draft of the first script. It's being edi edited in Oxford. Uh, so the version that you, we will read today is not an edited version. And it will still be refined because Dr. Babu Varghese, who is the expert in this area, has not yet had the time to look at it. So uh, the filming is from 6th to the 10th of November, five days, two episodes per day. Plus, there will be uh, two interviews. Uh, and uh, uh, my wife, Ruth, and Ashish will be with us. The Lord has provided a uh, an apartment where we can stay together. And if any of you want to drop in uh, to Oxford, please do. So that's the brief background. And um, what we think we will do today is um, read the script for your input. And then... Uh, uh, Dr. Alexander will moderate the discussion. Uh, and uh, so the reading itself should not take more than 30 minutes. Uh, so you should have plenty of time for interaction. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Vishal. Uh, I think I will uh, uh, kind of invite uh, Sister Oila to read the, the script, which I will also display on screen, and then, you know, so that you can read uh, also. Hey, everybody. Hi. So I'll, I'll start reading now? Yes. So uh, this is episode four, language and the democratization of knowledge. And we'll start with how language empowers people. India's renaissance began in Bengal in the early 19th century through a linguistic revolution. It was pioneered by a Baptist missionary, William Carey. This British cobbler turned linguist came to Bengal in 1793. At that time, India had three classical languages, Persian, Arabic, and Sanskrit. Indian elite had made our people powerless because they had turned them into languages of discrimination to deprive the common man of the power of knowledge. The transformation of the people began by transforming their dialects into literary languages. That process empowered the people because it democratized knowledge, making it available to everyone. Average Brahmin scholars memorized Sanskrit scriptures not for thought but for performing religious rituals. They did not allow Sanskrit to become the mother tongue of their own children because they refused to teach it to their wives, let alone to non brahmins Likewise, Muslim masses spoke local dialects while their religious leaders memorized the Quran in Arabic. 
Muslims ruled much of India for seven centuries, but they did not make Arabic the people's language of learning, of impartation of facts and thought. Two centuries before Kari reached Bengal, Mughal emperors had made Persian their court language. Their mother tongue was Chagatai, not Persian. They ruled Bengal but took no interest in developing Bengali, nor did they popularize Arabic and Sanskrit. Persian was a great language, but they made it a court language partly to make it difficult for Arabic knowing Muslims to learn state, state secrets. In 1765, the Mughals gave the administrative authority or Diwani over Bengal to the East India Company. Yet until 1800, the British merchants and rulers took no interest in Bengali dialects spoken by the people they governed. The only educational institution that the British company established was the Calcutta Madrasa. It was created to teach Arabic, Persian, and Islamic laws. Arts and science, literature, or humanities had no place in the curriculum. Ten years later, in 1791, the British company, not Hindu temples or ashrams, established the Banaras Sanskrit College in the state of Varanasi. Two centuries later, in 1974, the government of India upgraded it to become Sampurnanan Sanskrit University. So, this religious and political indifference to India's intellectual progress began to change when British evangelicals responded to Charles Grant's appeal to Christians to assume the, to assume the moral responsibility for the development of the people of India. Grant's observation on the Asiatic subjects of Great Britain inspired an evangelical member of parliament, Wilbur, William Wilberforce, to campaign for India's education. Grant and Wilberforce argued that it is immoral for Britain to send only merchants and mercenaries to India. Britain must also send educators. At that time, secular education did not exist anywhere in the world. In Europe, education was a ministry of the church because the Bible said that God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The idea that every child needed to be educated was the practical application of the New Testament's teaching that every child of God needed to serve his heavenly father as a priest and manage God's kingdom on earth as a prince or king. No one can do God's will on earth if he or she does not know God. For this reason, everyone needed to study God's word. That required translating the scriptures into every child's mother tongue. This theological outlook had started the process of transforming Europe's dialects into modern literary languages such as German, English, and French. The campaign for India's education initiated by Charles Grant and led by Wilberforce was understood in the light of the Bible's theology of language and education. Everyone understood that to send educators meant to send missionaries. Their mission will be to serve God and people, not money. Enriching people's dialects to become literary languages will be one of the foundation stones of India's awakening. Wilberforce began the campaign for South Asian uh, education in 1793. 20 years later, in 1813, British Parliament approved a new charter of the East India Company. It required the company to spend rupees one lakh per year for the education of the people of India. How should this money be used? British rulers decided to use that money to establish a Sanskrit college in Calcutta. This triggered the language controversy, which was resolved by the Macaulay Minute of 1835. Macaulay favored English as the language that ought to enrich the vernacular, including Bengali, that had been suggested by Charles Grant in 1792 and Rajara Mohan Rai became its champion in 1823. So we move on to Ram Mohan Rai's opposition on Sanskrit, uh, opposition to Sanskrit. Rajara Mohan Rai taught Sanskrit to William Carey while learning English from Carey. That interaction so changed him that he became a vocal opponent of the British plan to establish Calcutta Sanskrit College. On 11th December, 1823, Roy wrote the British prime minister William Pitt that the decision to teach Sanskrit system of education would be best calculated to keep this country in darkness. 
perpetuating Sanskrit education will be contrary to the spirit of the great movement that had required the company to invest money to educate India. Roy was a Brahmin and a Sanskrit scholar, but he opposed the company hiring pundits to teach Sanskrit. The British policy, he wrote, ought to be to promote a more liberal and enlightened system of instruction, embracing mathematics, natural philosophy, chemistry, and anatomy with other useful sciences. Roy knew that the pundits' monopoly of Sanskrit had stunted and enslaved Indian minds. Language is the God-given means to open and enhance the mind. He had grasped the Bible's idea that language is God's gift to humanity. It binds God's children into a community of ideas and values. Language makes us different from animals that are herded together by instinct, fear, and force. And language allows us to improve our community by thinking critically in order to seek truth and wisdom. This is necessary to steward the creation. Language should not be what pundits have made it, a means of uncritical memorization of mantras. Why did pundits reduce language to this? They sought not the truth, but occult powers to appease gods and control demons. A few decades later, Mahatma Phule said the pundits used their occult, hidden and secret knowledge to intimidate people in order to collect appeasement prize for unknown gods. Roy knew that Sanskrit had closed the Indian mind. Pundits had not written books on nature, science, medicine, agriculture, technology, law, history, geography, governance, etc. Nor had they developed the dialects into literary languages. They imposed a hierarchical system of high and low varnas that precluded developing everyone's intellectual potential. The Aryans came to India with Sanskrit and Vedas, and they were proud of their scriptures. They made zero effort to translate Sanskrit scriptures into the languages of the people. A rare exception was Goswami Tulsidas, who died in 1623. He paraphrased the Sanskrit epic Ramayana into Avadi dialect, calling it Ram Charit Manas. Avadi was spoken around Varanasi and Ayodhya, and for his audacity to compose their sacred story in a dialect, other pundits refused to acknowledge it as sacred scripture. In any case, the people who spoke Avadi did not read it. There were no schools to teach the common man to read and write his mother tongue. Tulsidat's work became influential long after him, and when it began to be dramatized as Ram Leela, dramatized as Ram Leela, yeah. William Carey, a British missionary, translated the Ramayana into English. In late 19th century, Reverend Samuel Kellogg, an American Presbyterian missionary, fused Awadi with 10 other dialects to create modern Hindi grammar. Kellogg lived in my hometown, that is Dr. Vishal's hometown, Allahabad, just two kilometers north of Tulsidas, Benares. Alhabadi speak Kellogg's Hindi, but without training, no one in Alhabad can understand a single Awadi stanza of uh, Ram Charit Manas. And we move on to William Carey and uh, Bible translations. Kellogg, who created the Hindi grammar that we use today, followed Carey's monumental linguistic revolution. He completed the work of his predecessors. John Gilchrist, a surgeon in the East India Company, had combined a number of dialects to create what he called Hindustani. Henry Martin, a chaplain with the company, used other pre-existing dialects, Persian and Arabic, to translate the Bible into what we know as Urdu. Kellogg, encouraged by some Sanskrit scholars, followed up on Gilchrist and Martin to create Hindi grammar, using Tulsidas Ram Charit Manas as his literary base. Translating the Bible into the languages of the people was a monumental grassroots revolution. It did for India what reformers John Wycliffe, Martin Luther, and William Tyndale had done for reforming Europe's education, literature and culture, economy, and governance. Bengali, Urdu, Hindi, and other languages did not exist when William Carey arrived in India. Bartendu Harish Chandra, the first Indian writer of modern Hindi, was born 11 years after Kellogg. To deprive people of the ability to read, think, and write in their own language is a strategy to condemn, their, condemn them to ignorance. This makes them easy prey to unscrupulous clergy, usually in league with the aristocracy. Ignorance violates their dignity of being made in the image of the all-wise creator. 
The Bible that liberated Europe from its oppressive religion also began India's transformation. The Bible's enormous impact on every Indian language, literacy, literature, and education has been best studied by Dr. Babu Varghese in his book, Let There Be India, Impact of the Bible on Nation Building. We can illustrate his thesis with two examples. Uh, the first one is a case study about Baptists and Bengali. The advocate in chief of the Indian vernaculars worked in Sarampur and Calcutta. His name, as I said, was William Carey. I call him the father of modern India. He had translated the Bible into Bengali before opening his mission in Sarampur in 1800. Carey fused several dialects to create Bengali as a literary language. With the pen of Rabindranath Tagore, Bengali went on to win the first Nobel Prize for India. Merely 10 decades prior to Tagore, his own city of Calcutta, the capital of Bengal province, did not have a single qualified teacher of Bengali. Bengal did not lack learned pundits, but uh, they considered Bengali a language fit only for women and demons. Mr. Sushil Kumar Dev points out in his study, Bengali literature in the 19th century, that it was Carey and his missionary colleagues who raised the language from the debased condition of an unsettled dialect to the character of a regular and permanent form of speech. The Nobel Prize Committee noted that Bengali songs of the Gitanjali displayed both the influence Carey's language as well as the Bible's theistic worldview. In Sarampur and more especially in Calcutta, William Carey started translating the Bible in multiple languages with help from pundits who taught languages to civil servants at the Fort William College. When some company directors began to object that their profits were being used to translate the Bible, Charles Grant and other organized British and Foreign Bible Society to finance the translation work. Sarampur Mission Press printed these vernacular Bibles and invented the fonts for different scripts. The mission also manufactured the paper needed for printing. The fonts, the paper, and the printing press began to open the Indian mind because, as we will see in other episodes, the missionary movement undergirded the historic effort by spreading literacy, printing textbooks for schools, and initi initiating journalism. Indian elite had kept classic languages, Sanskrit, Persian, and Arabic, for themselves. Missionaries allowed them to keep their monopoly, but went on to empower the people by enriching vernacular languages. Today, only about 25,000 Indians speak Sanskrit, while 234 million people speak Bengali as their native tongue. Hindi is spoken by about 585 million people. William Carey agreed with Alexander Duff and others that enriching vernaculars required teaching English to the people who wanted to develop their mother tongue. However, his mission also noted that the craze for English among the upper caste Indians was problematic. They did not learn English for the general welfare of the society. Their objective was selfish, personal and professional advancement. They observed that a little knowledge of English was turning the finest youth of Bengal into mercenary copies. They remained ignorant of their own language, Bengali, without the Bible's command to love your neighbor as yourself. They remained unconcerned about wisdom, beauty and goodness and the truth that English language and literature offered. The East India Company needed hirelings and therefore taught English to some youth, but those efforts would never have produced a Roy or a Tagore. They were the fruit of Bengali Bible. And the next case study is on Presbyterians and Punjabi. Stationed in Bengal in the East, William Carey strove to translate the Bible for the regions he never personally visited. In 1811, Carey published the first Punjabi Bible followed by grammar in 1812. By 1815, the mission press had printed the first ever prose work in Gurmukhi character, the Punjabi New Testament. The first set of missionaries, the American Presbyterians, set foot on Punjab in 1834. They discovered that Carey's translation of the Bible was already circulating in Punjab. They noticed its weakness and began a fresh translation of the Bible in Punjabi, while also preparing a grammar and dictionary on ground zero. John Newton published the new and comprehensive Punjabi grammar in 1851, and the other significant work, the dictionary by Levi Janvier, came out in 1854. 
the fresh translation of the New Testament was published in 1868, marking the transition from traditional to modern Punjabi. The Bible translation movement made it possible for the East India Company to replace Persian with local vernaculars as official administrative languages. In the light of Act 29 of 1883, Punjabi should have been designated as the official language of Punjab. However, due to administrative and political considerations and because Punjabi was still underdeveloped, the Punjab government of the time made Urdu its official language. Punjabi, the people's language, lost out as the language of the educated elite. Languages do, do need patrons. Without institutional support, languages rarely develop and sustain themselves. Persian, for example, was a court language of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, the greatest Sikh ruler of the time. Sikh writers and other Sikh principalities wrote in Braj, the popular literary language of the North India. Urdu and Persian continued to hold sway over the educated elite of Punjab. The Bible movement empowered the mother tongue of the masses. Christian missionaries changed Punjab because the Bible taught them that God wanted all people to know the liberating truth. Official policies and the prejudices of the native elite did not deter missionary scholars. They continued to publish and print the good news of salvation in Punjabi. Thus, American Presbyterians and later the CMS missionaries became the alternate patrons of the Punjabi language in the 19th century. Their labor made it possible for the later resurgent Sikh movement to promote and develop the Punjabi language. Punjab progressed because the missionaries did not limit their effort to publishing the Bible and devotional texts. They introduced a variety of literary modes to Punjabi. One act plays, short stories, and especially the novel, the first Punjabi novel, Jyoti Rudai, came out of the missionary quarters in 1882. That is 16 years prior to Sundari, the novel by Sikh writer Bhai Veet Singh. Begotted minds find it difficult to give credit where it is due. Yet an eminent Punjabi scholar, Gurcharan Singh Arshi, acknowledged, that impact, acknowledged the impact of the Bible and the missionaries in these words. Though Christian missionaries came with the intention of propagation and advancement of their religion, in that endeavor, they so enrich Punjabi language and literature that today Punjabi literature is not inferior in any way to literature in other languages. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Oila. It's a very wonderful reading uh, from you. Uh, I think uh, Brother Ashish is uh, ready to yes take on the rest of the analysis and the discussion. Thank you, uh, Brother Prashant. Thank you, uh, Oila, for this uh, wonderful reading. Uh, we have been talking about these issues uh, in different ways over a period of time, but uh, uh, I think it is uh, an important. Uh... Excuse me. Hello. You're very soft. Ah, now it's okay. You're very soft. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Right. Yes. Um, so thank you, Oila, and thank you, uh, Prashant, for uh, coordinating this. We have been discussing these issues uh, for, for you know for a period of time, and uh, I think uh, you know working on the languages of people has been one of the most important uh, aspects and of, of the uh, you know bible movement and missionary movement uh, very interesting thing that you know we saw that uh, bible translations were not merely uh, you know giving the religious education or theological education it was impacting uh, you know a large area uh, of uh, you know the the creative writing side also you know in uh, bengali we saw that gitanjali uh, that, which is uh, uh, the nobel prize winning uh, uh, work you know it came in bengali and then in punjabi you saw that so many uh, literary works they came out of that uh, so the idea that uh, working in the uh, sphere of languages uh, help to democratize knowledge uh, you know it the the knowledge knowledge creation was no longer the uh, 
private property of few castes or the dominant people but uh, because now the people's language had gotten respectability everybody was free to make his or her contribution so th that that is an interesting thing um, which should be uh, widely known and discussed but we will open the floor for any other comments that anybody may have uh, or uh, it may be a question it may also be a suggestion how to improve or uh, you know basically share what what this presentation has uh, brought to you so please uh, go ahead and we will see Dr. Babu Varghese, of course, has worked on uh, almost all the major languages and other languages. Uh, and we have only talked about just the two languages. If anybody wants to share any anecdote or anything about any other language that you know of, uh, you could also share that. So I think in uh, different uh, language, uh, I mean, in different geographies in India, uh, different uh, things were already taking place. Like in, uh, for example, in the 17th century, I think uh, Tamil Bible was already up and, you know, printed in Tankubar, which is like a, you know, a part of Tamil Nadu. Um, and so, uh, and also the Malayalam Bible by, I mean, it is a similar time frame. So, um, my, my Tamil Bible was all, I mean, Tamil was one of the earliest uh, Bibles in the vernacular. You are, you are muted, uh, Prashant. Yes, I I finished my comment. I said okay. It is already uh, it precedes you know um, Sanskrit Bible or you know I mean the Bengali Renaissance, but um, by I think at least a century. Uh, yeah, I mean Ziegenbalg had come in seventeen oh six, and uh, the work had started there. So it's in the same century. Uh, so th th that's true. And then, of course, uh, Tanjore was one of the main centers of, uh, you know, the Madras Renaissance. And uh, some of these German and Danish missionaries were already working there. Uh, Christian Schwartz, uh, of course, uh, the great Christian Schwartz was there. And, uh, you know, he was teaching the Maharaja of Tanjore, who was actually a Maratha uh, king. So, and that's why, you know, that, that, that is an, another important uh, part of the great uh, Bible translation and missionary endeavors, because the Tanjore uh, Renaissance was part of that, what Christian Schwartz was doing, and the Sarfoji Maharaj, I think, uh, of Tanjore, uh, he was his uh, kind of student, and so he uh, also um, promoted a lot of art and literature and those kind of things. Yes, so you're right. So, you know, if you go to different parts of the country, you'll find the different works that were going on. Um, yes. And obviously, it's it's not just literary writing. I mean, Bible translation is one thing, literary writing is another thing. And then you see journalism is yet another thing where, uh, you know, Bible translations, uh, because Bible translators were also trying to provide a lot of uh, reading material, you know, so people should have reading material uh, other than the Bible because they were running their schools as well because missionaries as educators, as the paper says, that in 1813 missionaries had come as educators. So they were not only just, you know, translating the Bible, they were not just uh, promoting literature, they were also publishing uh, newspapers, periodicals. And again, very importantly, they had set up a lot of textbook societies. So they were publishing a lot of textbooks. Um, so in that sense, that there's a whole uh, 
you know an, a new ecosystem of knowledge was being created around bible translation so in the center was a bible translation but you have different spokes coming out and there's this whole uh, you know and for every language you could do that you know right thank you any other comment uh, uh, can I share a little experience of my tribe? I'm Sumshot from Manipur. Uh, we had our uh, Bible uh, in 29, uh, 2021. And the problem now with the community is that uh, we don't have much of other materials and uh, with the help of SIL, we were able to conduct some workshops and we started developing little uh, booklets, but then we were not really able to continue moving uh, fast because I think one reason is uh, the community doesn't really realize that language is important or when I say we may lose our language, Many didn't believe because we are still speaking. And how do you say that we will lose our language? So that way, I think the community uh, embracement of that need to really work on improving the language is something that we lack. And then the other thing is having uh, support. For example, when we uh, write the little storybooks, we want people to uh, read it or we we want to get it published but as the committee is a small community and people uh, in the community don't really feel the need to support it so that lack of support could not get uh, enough resources for us to enable to print them so that we make those available to the community so now we had the Bible, but then there's a huge gap because people don't really uh, uh, have that uh, reading from our own, like the alphabets to reading something. And now you are reading this Bible and many fear reading it because from not reading at all anything in your language, suddenly when you are having this huge book, which is looking very thick and huge, people also fear, I think. So we had that gap in between right now. So how do we encourage people to read? Or what will be the way that we can help bridge this uh, gap from not having anything to having this Bible? But how do we also constantly work on towards uh, improving our other literature the folk tales that we have, the songs that we have, or this uh, lullabies or anything that we have orally, if it is widely uh, what you call written down and then uh, circulated within the community, maybe at least younger children would be interested to reading. And the other situation we had is uh, my parents' age, who never go to school did not have any chance of reading even Manipuri. Uh, back then, it was in Bengali script, but now the, Maitis, the Manipuri have their own script. So who uh, some group of people, the elders who never go to school are in no way able to read. So I have an interest of having, like, if the Bible can be... Hmm, we can have it in audio, then people who don't know how to read can at least get to listen. Thank you. I'm just sharing my uh, issues or my context. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you very much uh, because these are, uh, you know, real problems and uh, real issues. And you also uh, you shared some very practical problems of uh, uh, resources and finance and, and those things are there. Uh, interestingly, what the Bible translators were doing as they were translating the Bible 
one very important thing that they did uh, was they translated not just the Bible, but they also translated storybook. And one of the most famous uh, stories was A Pilgrim's Progress. You know, and Pilgrim's Progress became actually uh, the second most translated work uh, in all the missionary circles after the Bible. And uh, th this was because this was something that people could more readily relate to. This became very popular and it became a, a kind of a seed out of which a lot of other stories started coming out. So maybe that is something that can be thought of. Uh, I mean, I'm not recommending it, but I'm just saying that that is historically that was one of the examples that we have. Uh, we have uh, two more hands that have been raised. Uh, Brother Barcos can ask and then Brother Thomas Daniel can ask. Brother Barcos, okay. please. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think I'll just uh, give a little information about uh, my language, uh, the Khasi language. Uh, we um, inhabit about half of Meghalaya and, uh, part, um, of course, some parts of Assam also. Now, um, the first missionaries who came here, really, of course, were some Bengali missionaries who had come from the Kari mission, but uh, they had introduced the Bengali script, but it didn't catch uh, on because uh, there are quite a few pronunciations in the our language which could not be captured by the Bengali script. Um, 1841, we had the Welsh missionary come in here, the first man who came was Thomas Jones, and he soon um, uh, quickly got, uh, in a, you know, understood and learned the language. And then he found that um, the most suitable script was the Roman script. And then he adapted quite a few other alphabets, uh, which would suit uh, our pronunciations. And so um, we had the uh, Roman script coming in. He translated the Bible within a period of about uh, the New Testament in about uh, six years he was here. Of course, this man was um, unique because uh, he not only um, very similar to Kerry that way, not merely did he um, translate the Bible, but then he taught uh, us, he introduced us into all kinds of modern uh, work uh, or expertise, you can say, skills like carpentry, um, like uh, using lime because we had a lot of limestone. So he taught us how to use both the lime and the coal. Uh, he taught, he introduced uh, potato cultivation. He, he um, encouraged the growth of tea and quite a lot of other things. So he really transformed uh, the Khasis. Now, um, the Khasi language, uh, I would say that Khasi tribe as a whole, you know, we were made up of uh, several sub tribes with numerous dialects and you'd have the variations within the next, so within five to 10 kilometers, there were variations. And the further you got, you really couldn't understand each other. But the Bible worked to create one language among the Khasis, uh, which was understood throughout the Khasi inhabited areas. It also served to unify the various sub-tribes uh, so that uh, we didn't have a problem of, you know, even though we were recognized, there's several sub-tribes sub, sub uh, uh, recognized in the schedule, yet you will find that when you come to the Khasi and Jantia Hills, you'll find hardly any other people will, will um, identify themselves by these uh, sub-tribes, which are constitutionally recognized. So the bulk would will just say that we are simply Khasis. So that has unified the people, given a, a common language through the whole um, uh, tribe. And uh, of course, the education was fantastic because he, this man, Thomas Jones, became the father, you can say, of the Khasi alphabet. And in fact, you can say that he really, he was the one who promoted the whole, the growth of the Khasi literature because we simply had nothing. I think we, we really had nothing before he introduced uh, the Bible. So the Bible today, um, uh, you will find, of course, is uh, still, uh, a, 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 you know, um, a textbook 
it remains a textbook in um, in schools and uh, now of course right now it is no longer a textbook but until a few years back it was a textbook in schools and which is true for most of the northeast so the work which the translating translation of the bible has been fantastic because it completely changed our education it completely changed enlightened us it opened a whole lot of things for people from uh, from my tribe uh, and i think for most the northeast thank you yes thank you very much i think that's uh... A wonderful comment that how uh, you know the Khasi language and the biblical language uh, unified the people and uh, this is something interesting because I uh, see I come from a Punjabi speaking uh, land you know but I, I work here in uh, in UP in Allahabad and uh, you know the kind of Hindi that I learned in my school uh, is very different from the Hindi which is actually spoken here on the street you know, uh, but when you read the books, they are same books, you know. So the, the Hindi that has been standardized, uh, you know, we, we talked about the Samuel Kellogg and, uh, you know, so the spoken language may be different on the ground, but the written language and the language of formal communication, the language of literary uh, composition is, is standardized. But then what happens from uh, UP, if I go to a place called Jharkhand, where I went a few years back, I realized that their Hindi is much closer to my Hindi because the Jharkhandis are also not the native Hindi speakers. So they have also learned Hindi from the you know school textbooks. So my Hindi and their Hindi is much closer, even the spoken language, right? So my Hindi and the UP Hindi is, uh, is similar in terms of writing. But my Hindi and Jharkhandi Hindi is, sim uh, is similar in terms even of speaking. So, you know, that kind of uh, unity that is uh, formed by language uh, is, is something very interesting and uh, fascinating. So, yes, uh, thank you for that, that whole point. And Thomas Jones, uh, we need to uh, research him even more. And, uh, you know... Uh, and, and, and it's amazing uh, what you say about him that not only the Bible translation, but also the potato cultivation or carpentry and those kind of things that is, I mean, these, these are really the uh, pioneers, which uh, very few people come to know about, you know, uh, right now, people don't know uh, the, the massive work uh, they have done. So this needs to really go out. Uh, Brother Thomas, uh, if you would like to say something. Yeah, it is a, an observation and a suggestion for the script and its emphasis um, that the missionaries translated the Bible into various languages is well known. But when you enter into dialogue with uh, our non-Christian friends of the current, uh, current climate, they will just brush it aside by saying, ah, of course, they wanted to spread Christianity. They wanted to convert people. That's why they did it. There is, of course, an element of truth in that. But what we know, and it has come out uh, clearly from Ashish, uh, that, uh, sorry, the material that was read out, as well as other writings of Vishal and Babu and all, that this was, if it was only to convert people, why did they create uh, other literature? Why did they translate? other works into the vernacular, into Hindi and other uh, languages. So their intention was much more comprehensive and integrated. They wanted to bless the society by improving its language. Uh, this, when we read Macaulay's Minute, very clearly explains that, let us teach English to a few people so that they will in turn go and enrich the vernacular. That part is missed out by the critics. So I think in our presentation, the script making and all, this part has to be emphasized that the, the, the improvement in the language all around was not merely an unintended consequence of the missionaries translating the Bible. Rather, that was also part of their overall intention. So just now we heard about potato cultivation and all that. Why did a a group of people who want, simply wanted to convert people, uh, why did they have to in, involve in all these other active, other things? 
So what I want to say is that in our, we should li little more explain and make it very clear that it was not simply to come and uh, change people's religion, but to, to, to bring overall blessing and improvement to their lives that these people came and worked and uh, sacrificed their life. Um, the very fact that the first novels and dramas perhaps written in several Indian languages were not by Indians, but by Western missionaries. That is really a mind blowing concept, blowing fact. So I think we should capitalize on those things and emphasize these things a little more. That's a small suggestion. Yeah, th thank you, brother. I think that is uh, the fundamental question. That's the foundational question. And you are right in saying that people know that missionaries have worked uh, on all these languages, but their contribution is dismissed uh, very nonchalantly, saying that they only did it to spread their religion. Now, the, the interesting question, if we go back to the uh, example of Punjab, in Punjab, what had happened, that Persian was the court language. And the British government, uh, you know, it, it replaced Persian with Urdu. Now, if missionaries really were just interested in their own, in the spreading of their own language, it was much easier for them to start printing all their works in Urdu, right? Because in that sense, they will, they would have gotten support of the government because the government wants to promote Urdu. So missionaries would have joined hands with them. And nobody was thinking very highly of Punjabi language because Punjabi at that time wasn't very well developed. And people said that it is just a you know, sub-language, a patois. It is not even a developed language. So it would have gone into disuse. But missionaries said, no, 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 this is the people's language. This is their mother tongue. So we will not only continue to publish in that language, we will also develop the script. You know, so Gurumukh, for example, in Punjab, uh, it, it is not, I mean, you, we have to give that, okay, the Sikh preachers were speaking in Punjabi and the Muslim Sufis were also using Punjabi, but many of them were using the Persian script to write Punjabi. So missionaries actually started writing Punjabi and popularizing Punjabi and standardizing Punjabi in the Gurumukhi script, which was the script of the region, right? So uh, factually speaking, they are the ones who became the patrons of the language without their support Punjabi could not have gotten to the stage where it is you know uh, they did not collude with the uh, colonial masters in that sense right which is generally uh, said against uh, against them that is number one the number two thing is that you cannot uh, you know uh, dispute the fact <clears throat> that languages have always had something to do with religion. See, most people support the language because their sacred scriptures are in that language. So it goes for every language. I mean, again, taking the example of Punjab, if you look at the history of the literature of Punjab, they would say that Guru Nanak Dev, the first Sikh guru, was also one of the first literary writers in the language. But what kind of language he was using, what kind of literature? That literature was only a spiritual and religious literature. Similarly, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was going in Bengal, he was, you know, doing all religious literature. When you talk about uh, Tulsi Das, who, uh, you know, popularized Avadhi, he was writing a poem for, which is religious in nature. So everybody, every person or every group which is working with the language has certain religious motive, right? So that cannot be discounted. Like why are in Punjab, Sikhs are so emotional about Punjabi because they know that their scriptures are in that language. Their guru spoke that language, you know? So I think it is, uh, it is silly and uh, hypocritical to say that religion, you know, languages should not have anything to do with religion. So, you know, look at the ancient Sanskrit. Why was Sanskrit in that sense, uh, so fiercely guarded because it was, you know, uh, the language that belonged to the gods and the common men cannot speak it. So uh, those issues have to be taken uh, care. And the third thing is that missionaries were always aware that they are not going to create, I mean, they are not going to create the language for us. Language will work, will be the work of the local people always. 
but they always knew they were aware that we are going to lay the foundation of the great literature in that vernacular language because they knew from their experience even in europe that bible translation is the nucleus of literary development of any culture so when the bible is translated from latin or greek to let's say germany or let's say to english we know that the great translation or the great literary work uh, happens you know so when tyndale translated uh, the bible into uh, english right uh, and so that was the book that was taken up by king um, that was the version that king james used and then king james version became the standard version in which the english language was written in the 17th century and the 16th century so uh, and this was the knowledge through with which many of the missionaries came here and they knew that the people's language will develop if we give it respectability and that's what they were working on so these are just a few thoughts that i have we may actually develop them so that's a very uh, i mean there's a wonderful question and uh, and point of the thomas ask you one ashish i just want to ask you one thing please uh, wasn't yes. uh, the guru granth sahib in punjabi no guru granth sahib uh, actually is not in one language it has various languages so it it has uh, punjabi it has parts part of it uh, are in braj it's in persian it's in sindhi it's in khadi boli you know because uh, kabir is also included in part of granth sahib so you have uh, you know the uh, eastern languages also there i mean eastern indian languages also there so there are no, what I, variety what I want of to say, no what i want to say is when they when when this guru bani is being sent uh, uh, broadcast on that from the golden temple is it in punjabi yeah. well it is an older kind of punjabi yeah so then is... why didn't why didn't that why didn't that take it up i mean why didn't that take up during that time why was it not suppressed and urdu was put put as the or persian was put as the official language of punjab i just don't know. well i just want to have a knowledge on that because uh, that whole area the northwest was under the muslim rule for a very long time you know actually uh, punjab was a muslim majority place uh, sikhs were a very small minority if you look at the undivided punjab uh, you know which the part of it has gone to uh, pakistan now so the the whole punjab was a muslim majority place you know and uh, sikhs were a minority and even after you see partition of india the punjab that we got has further divided into three states so you have himachal haryana and punjab so punjab sikhs are mostly in punjab uh himachal and haryana is again a very hindu dominated uh, areas so uh the, the muslims were there so the persian language as the paper argues that because of the mughal rule their nawabs and their regents were there so mostly persian uh, was used there and in any case in north india persian had become the uh, the language of the elite uh, urdu had become the language of the elite and uh, it it is not surprising that from Uh, delhi to lucknow to lahore you had this whole uh, very persian and uh, urdu speaking uh, populace yeah but it is surprising so that even even during the period of ranjit singh yes this was not developed i was really surprising that i mean he was the rule he was he ruled for a quite he was a powerful ruler he was a powerful ruler but his court language continued because you know th th there is always a continuity you know from okay. one to another so what okay. in fact the east india company what east india company did was actually very uh, disruptive they were the ones who said that instead of persian we will start uh, using the local language in the courts uh, especially the you know judiciary and all those things so that's how bengali became the court language in bengal and marathi became a kind of a language of lower courts in maharashtra but in punjab they could not do that because punjabi was still not developed so they had to have a compromise and this they start they thought like we can use urdu okay. and punjabi's status as a, as a literary language for a very long time was very uncertain so there are many uh, people from punjab who chose not to write in punjabi so many of them became very popular and famous urdu writers right and many of them became very popular and famous hindi writers also so you know that's a very interesting thank thing yeah yeah and and kushwant singh of course became one of the finest english writers you know hmm. yes brother prem uh, you have raised your hand
Yeah, just I wanted to tell uh, the uh, I just wanted to give information for the person who spoke, who told that uh, she wanted to have a Manipuri Bible uh, heard. There is Bible Is app. Uh, the app is called Bible Is, and this app has almost uh, two hundred and two thousand twenty five language audio Bibles, and two thousand uh, and uh, the same number of languages of Jesus film, so in their own languages, so they can use this app, Bible is app, so this will help them. Uh, that is in Manipuri. I just opened and saw it is having Latin script and uh, Bengali script. Yeah, that's what I just thank wanted to say. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, my language is Lamka. Not Manipuri, though. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Right. Any, any well, other? Uh, yeah. Can I ask a question? Am I audible? Yes. Dr. Okay, so uh, yeah, Aniket. Okay, I'm from Maharashtra. I'm from Pune. So I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, you know, it, it's it's an observation. It's not a question per se, but uh, uh, the lay folks in anywhere in the country, especially in in, in what I've observed in Maharashtra, is that uh, uh, language is a vehicle to uh, get people connected to uh, uh, to the theology or the spirituality of Christ, but uh, uh, not many are fluent or not many are people, the common folks I'm talking about, they're interested in reading. So um, I just wanted to ask you, how, how should we tide over this issue? Um, I hope I am getting my question. And my second question is that Brother Pankaj Parmar has asked a very pertinent question that, how do we respond to current critics like Sai Deepak and Ra uh, Rajiv Malhotra? Because these people are all over the place, you know, on YouTube, everywhere. And suddenly they have just risen from uh, nowhere in the last five, ten years. And, and they are, you know, in, 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 they are on a mission to debunk everything. What Christianity or what the mission has, you know, achieved in the last uh, 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 300, 400 years. Okay, so how do we counter them? Because our people need those kind of strategies, you know, and if, if like uh, for a learned person like you might, uh, you know, give us some way of, you know, how to you know, engage with them and how to, you know, uh, counter them. So I just wanted to uh, know your thoughts on uh, these two pertinent questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's that's very interesting. The first question and second question probably are linked in a way like that. Even if you write the books, who will read? Because our people are not reading. So why should we read? Uh, you know, we should write. Uh, that's that's the thing. But uh, well, that's that's in a lighter way. Uh, but the, the thing is that. Uh, can I give a uh, quick answer to that question? Then you yes. Can Please, please. Yeah, the short answer and the shortcut, if I may say so, is to read uh, Vishal's two, three books about India, starting with India, the Grand Experiment, now the forthcoming William Carey, Father of Modern India, then the Letters to a Postmodern Hindu Missionary Conspiracy. If you read this and digest it, you can address all these people very easily. Thank you. Yeah, 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 Thomas, I think, yeah, yeah. I've, I, I've myself, uh, you know, given, gifted a lot of books of Vishal's to my friends. I've been a doctor, a Mavis doctor. I have tried to, you know, disseminate a lot of, uh, uh, you know, information regarding the missionary movement, uh, especially through books of uh, Vishal, Mangalwadis. But uh, the point is that, as somebody had rightly pointed out, that they are just kind of dismissed non challengedly I think it was Brother Ashish who said this, uh, you know. And then how do we make them read? And, you know, unless they, uh, until they read, they will not come to know how things have unfolded, you know, through the mission movement. So my, the same question again comes back. How do we get them to read or, you know, maybe we can use the digital media. So, so I'm just perplexed, you know, if somebody can throw the light on that. 
Mm. How to open a closed mind is the question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that that would be uh, better said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Why, why don't Christians read? I mean, that's uh, an important question. Uh, I think it, it also has to do, and uh, maybe Vishal can speak on it later, is that the kind of uh, theological framework within which many of us think and work, uh, one is that uh, people tell you that, okay, you know, when I was young, so many people in my church would say that, oh, Bible is the only book you must read. You don't need to bother about other things. And uh, then there were some people who say that, you know, why are you talking about all these things, research and history and all? Jesus is going to come and then all your research will be, you know, left, uh, you know, is of no use. So there is this whole, uh, I think, a certain, I mean, th this may also be, you know, the, the popular dispensationalist kind of uh, influence on our thinking. But I, I think it also is certain, uh, you know, residual of the uh, fatalistic mind uh, that uh, we have still retained probably, you know. So it doesn't really help us uh, or inspire us to take the leadership in the intellectual sphere. The other thing is that we are so happy, uh, you know, to, we sit on the laurels of that Christians have done a lot in the area of education, Christians have done a lot in the area of, uh, you know, medical, but we forget that, uh, the, you know, Christians have done a lot in the area of intellectual uh, output as well, you know. In, in terms of, uh, as I said, in literature, in terms of journalism. Uh, but those things are never talked about in our uh, churches. So that's an important part. I think we need to educate ourselves that how we, our people were some of the pioneers in these fields. You know, uh, how, how some of our people were pioneers in the field of uh, journalism, in the field of creative writing, in the field of law. And these are certain areas in which we are not interested. Uh, this has to do with uh, the theological mindset, the fatalistic mindset, and lack of discussion uh, on these issues. Uh, so I, I'll stop here. And there's one more brother, Barnabas. Uh, we can take your comment, brother. And then brother Uday Bora is there. And then we can ask Vishal if he has to say something. Uh, brother uh, Barnabas. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I just wanted to share something with regard to uh, trying to get the attention of uh, the younger generations. I mean, I watch a lot of uh, stuff on YouTube, and uh, Dr. Mangalwadi is also speaking with uh, Jordan Peterson. I mean, one of the reasons why he's so popular is because he's viral. And uh, it's because I think they they take... Uh, the essence of what he says and share it as sound bites. So you can find them on YouTube, you can find them on Rumble, you can find them on TikTok. Uh, and I think Dr. Mangalwadi's uh, thoughts are really awesome. But it's time that we actually get into media that the way we need to. We've kind of fallen back on that in terms of sharing stuff like this. I mean, you can talk about a lot of... Um, popular speakers. Now, a lot of them don't have anything except they're very, very repetitive. Dr. Mangalwadi's research, his, his uh, thought process, everything is, you know, extraordinary, quite brilliant. And I think it's important that we have to engage with people at the place where they are listening. I mean, if we just think about Jesus, Jesus went to the Samaritan woman at the well, and he went and spoke to her over there because that's where she would probably come uh, to draw water. Just where, I mean, that this is where people are. Nobody wants to read books. Very few people do. Everybody is just listening to sound bites. And a lot of it is nonsense. A lot of it is absolutely just, I mean, a lot of it is also demonic. It's just turning people's minds away from the truth. So I think there has to be a lot more effort to, to take uh, these words of wisdom and make it more accessible. Uh, put it in formats and, and, and medias that uh, people actually consume. Uh, I mean, this, these, these uh, longer discussions are great, but you know, we want a lot more people to listen to what the truth really is and where the truth actually came from. So I would I actually... 
yeah go ahead uh, brother you, your your point is really well taken uh, you know you have to inundate uh, the social media space with what vishal is saying but my uh, suggestion and my submission is that instead of vishal just recording and presenting all that he is saying i think the people who are part of this group should also take it upon themselves that we will create our own videos you know some of us can do that right uh, if we have read a, a one of vishal's books why don't we just have a quick review put it on youtube and uh, share with others why i think i i would suggest that especially the younger generation can can try doing that you know uh, they can have their own podcasts on on those books right uh, because unless it becomes a you know it's 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 a movement which takes a life of its own uh, you know it, it it we we cannot have vishal doing it uh, uh, everywhere all the time and uh, i think it's time that many of us uh, especially the youngers uh, younger generation you know start start doing that engage with that the and other thing is that even though we are saying that people now want to have small sound bites and small videos uh, i know by experience that even a small video small sound bite if you want to make it effective the person who makes it has to go through a whole process uh you know then he or she is then is going to give you in a bite sized so if i want to say something which is meaningful in a 2 minute video i must prepare for it for at least 20 hours you know or 10 hours at least that this is how it is going to be so we need i think a group of people maybe 10 20 30 people who devote themselves to deep study and then turn that deep study into smaller videos because that's that's how it will work you know it's not that everybody can just come and speak for 2 minutes and say something revelatory uh, that's that's not so, what i'm actually meaning what i'm what i'm no. actually talking about is you know there are uh things that dr mangalwadi shares right now it's important it i'm not asking him to do it i mean he's definitely not the person to sit and make videos yeah. but that material should be taken and smaller snippets should be should be done i mean i definitely agree with you that other people should come forward and do that but they can only do it if they have a calling yeah. like dr mangalwadi for this present generation Yeah so I mean it and it's not just the calling it's yeah it's it's you know it's it's not just the calling i think it's like the love of christ constrains me to do that I and mean, the people need that discipline we cannot just desire and uh, hope that it happens uh this is something that i think i we, we need to do and this is some of sometimes my uh, gripe also against even this group that we are part of that are we really producing content you know or we are coming every week here for some spiritual entertainment or are we really producing stuff you know uh and and not just with this group you know the, i'm part of a lot of whatsapp groups for example and i'm i, I leave a lot of whatsapp groups because there i see the lot of uh, people are very active very vocal but only within their echo chambers they do not go, come out and and produce something you know so that is uh, you know it's it's an it's a nice sentiment that we should have all this out but somebody has to do it you know just wanting it to happen is not going to help anyone uh we we have to have people to do it i mean that's all that i'm saying yeah thank you just one one thought i just want in, in a few seconds can i just put something add to this okay 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 aniket yeah just one please. yeah just five seconds so if you see the what uh, As- brother ashish was saying is nothing but uh, if you see the bhojan there is something called the bhojan youtubers meet these days on youtube uh, i i'm just uh, closely following this so these are all people who are from the uh, so called lower caste uh, backgrounds and uh, they have they are, they are just uh, their numbers have the the youtube channels numbers have just risen like anything in last 10 years and now they are having their own youtube bhojan meets as, uh, in delhi so this is one phenomena is something like that on those line on th- those scales we can uh, also achieve so what brother uh, ashish was saying has been uh, done by other people around which i i've been a witness to just wanted to add this yeah thank you yeah thank you thank you aniket uh, brother uday bora yes oh no um thank you for the opportunity here uh, this is the first time i'm joining this uh, group uh, 
joined the email list and uh, been reading uh, Dr. Vishal's book. Um, are you able to hear me or is it not clear? Oh, this is fine, fine, brother. Go ahead. Okay. So the I the last question is what I wanted to look into, especially when I read uh, Dr. Vishal's book. Um, and on the lines of that thought, I'll only take a couple of seconds here. Um, is that book has become uh, a guide for me to address a lot of young generation because I work with uh, almost from preteen till young adults in in America. I live in uh, Arizona here. Um, so within the church groups, uh, uh, my population is not uh, predominantly background of India, but people from here. Um, so when I use this material uh, a lot to actually educate their own history, because a good chunk of that is missed out and not knowing where their um, stumbling blocks are within the universities, colleges, and also schools uh, today. So the material, I think um, uh, I'm not a big YouTube guy to go on videos and all that, but I think it is uh, predominantly grassroots work, which is talking to the individuals, talking to the groups that you are involved in, uh, especially the church groups, because that becomes a set of fire. Because I see with the material that I've been sharing few moments or snippets of it has helped um, students here to get a perspective of what has happened in their history? Why am I today? Where am I today with the Bible illiteracy that has been increased a lot because students do not know where Genesis is. Um, that's where the whole illiteracy has come, which means there is an attack in terms of spiritual side and also in terms of the media that has taken over like say Jordan Peterson, small snippets, they became nuggets, but then that is not wisdom. It is just a thing that we are sharing, but it needs much more comprehensive study to work with the students, uh, not just a little uh, here and there shares uh, and things like that. And, and also the secrecy is the strength, uh, a good chunk of the time in the gospels, because you want to go to the personal life, you want to influence their change and their life in Christ. So I think it's grassroots of working with the small groups, working with the uh, people under the layer, and it spreads like fire within no time. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, brother. That's uh an interesting observation and yeah all the best with what you are doing god bless uh vishal would you like to close in 10 minutes we have sure <clears throat> thank you very much <clears throat> you know 25 years ago i was actually alone in saying some of these things but since then the lord has raised up many people we are very grateful to uh, prasant david who has been organizing these Thursday events, even today's. His wife is just about ready to uh, give birth to their second child. So, uh, but he's been working on this. Um, uh, Brother Barnabas Moses, who spoke a few minutes ago, he came forward a few weeks ago to proofread the book that should go to press next week. That's Truth Transforms a manifesto for ailing nation. So he's been not only translating the uh, proofreading that book, but also promoting it among his uh, friends. Uh, he's, uh, he's using LinkedIn, which I have been very reluctant to get into, but it is uh, necessary for us to use these social medias. And then Oela, who read the uh, script, uh, she is working for Ruatech, and Ruatech has been tremendous uh, support to us technologically. And uh, she is uh, attempting to do what uh, several of you have said should be done. So she is now managing the YouTube uh, channel, Vishal Mangalbadi, and it is uh, she's posting a lot of things which are helping to increase the viewership. So yes, if you like the YouTube channel and promote it, share different videos, um, th that would help raise the, um, 
the membership. Uh, now, uh, this particular episode, which we discussed today, was the first draft was written by Ashish, uh, collected from different uh, some of my books and some of his own research, particularly on Punjabi. And uh, we uh, will submit it. It's being edited in uh, uh, Oxford for language, but we will submit it to Babu Vargis for his uh, editing of the content. So unfortunately, he's not here with us today, but I'm sure he would agree with what uh, Brother um, Thomas Daniel has said. Uh, and uh, if uh, if Thomas, if you can help uh, highlight the point that you were making, <clears throat> which needs to be added, so even if it, it, it will change what you write, <clears throat> but it will help if you go ahead and uh, add your comment into the script itself. That this is what needs to be highlighted. Uh, so we will. Uh, it will make it easier because I'm working on the what, episode number one today, uh, but I'm also recording if, a video for uh, why I'm in Kona, Hawaii, uh, which was supposed to have done been done yesterday, but this afternoon I'm recording two videos for them. Then I'm recording two videos uh, for the conference in Hyderabad with by Right Theology Forum, Christopher. Um, John and Sudhakar Mandithoka. That's a big event on the uh, 10th of November, which I will redo uh, sort of the, my crash course on contemporary India. And what Dr. Anikanth just said about the Dalit uh, presence in social media on YouTube, that, that is true. I'm also following it fairly closely. Uh, and it is amazing that so many of them don't speak good Hindi. Their English is quite poor, uh, but they have done a fantastic job of using the social media. So there's enormous presence of uh, uh, Dalit and some OBC uh, on uh, YouTube. And it is a pity that we have not used it uh, as we should have used it. So uh, uh, those comments are very uh, useful and uh, we need help. Uh, one of the simplest help that you can give right away is uh, purchase a copy of the William Carey book, uh, The Father of Modern India. The last chapter, the sixth chapter, is a response to uh, Rajiv Malhotra's book, Breaking India. Uh, and uh, but if you put in even two sentences of review on Amazon, that will help. So the paperback is not yet available on Amazon, but it will be available. Uh, they have uh, Amazon has requested a few changes on how the page numbers are structured, etc. So as soon as we have another brother helping from Bangalore, Praneet. He has made those changes. Uh, the paperback edition will be available, but your reviews and uh, uh, commendations will help a lot in promoting that book. So even people like uh, Sai Deepak and Rajiv Malhotra, uh, these people will uh, might look at a book if it has many reviews uh, and if it is recommended by many people. So. Those uh, steps from you will help. Uh, so, so eventually, of course, we need you to begin to create your own uh, YouTube videos and uh, other uh, utilized social medias, but you can help in, in this way. So uh, Bless on Paul has just done one script on agriculture. Mercia, who is not with us right now, uh, she has done a little script on what the Bible did to women. Um, uh, Samuel Jacobson and his wife, Ishita, they are also expecting a baby. Uh, they have agreed to do a, a film script on uh, civil services in India. Uh, and Priya Aristotle has agreed to do a script 
on uh, the, uh, the Bible's impact on Indian penal code and Indian constitution. Uh, and uh, Ashish himself is doing uh, a uh, script on uh, the Bible's impact on Indian vernacular literature and also education. So uh, the whole group is involved. Um, and as a result of what uh, you have helped create, uh, I'm, I might mention without taking the name, that one person who is online with us, an Indian brother, he has helped Ashish financially uh, to come to England. And that's really appreciated. The Lord has given us housing now in both in London and in Oxford. Uh, and uh, But your financial contribution is uh, greatly respected. Um, so, uh, but as this team is building up, and uh, we are in uh, getting close to uh, becoming a movement that is an enormous potential. I think just for the English edition of William Carey book, uh, there is easily a Christian readership of 100,000, 1 lakh people. If, well, but we don't have the ability to reach those people. But if we can sell uh, one lakh copies of the book on William Carey, uh, we will have the money to get it translated into English in different languages, such as Telugu, uh, Tamil, Malayalam. Uh, we, there is manpower that is really capable of volunteering their time to translate it. Uh, but in Hindi, uh, we do not yet have, uh, you may know people who could help uh, volunteer as trans to translate because uh, we do not have the finances to pay for translation, and translation is really one uh, basic step in getting these this message out. We need uh, money to print these books. Uh, we need distribution, and uh, the the corruption in the evangelical movement uh, has destroyed our capacity to even distribute Hindi. Uh, books or English books in, in India. But thankfully, Rua Tech has built a, an online platform with trias.com so that distribution has become relatively easier. We don't need to have a lot of bookshops, um, but, but it needs promotion. Not many people know trias.com. And uh, so uh, this is just background comments. Uh, we will you know, uh, uh, Prashant is the one who organizes these Thursday events, but uh, next week we can take at least one more script uh, for if uh, no one else is doing a lecture. And uh, your participation is uh, very helpful. Um, that comment uh, that, yes, of course, the Bible had been translated into Tamil before William Carey came, but that uh, did not begin a linguistic revolution, and that did not begin a translation movement or a missionary movement. So there were things happening um, uh, much before William Carey arrived, uh, but the fact that the year in which he arrived, uh, Wilberforce had also taken up the cause of opening the Indian mine in the British Parliament, and had begun to generate as uh, he, he won the vote in House of Commons, he lost it in ha ha House of Lords. So uh, that whole movement which began the renaissance of uh, what is called the Indian Renaissance of people like Radha, Ram Mohan Roy coming on board um, and accepting the biblical ideas uh, and it is not translation of the Bible into Tamil or Bengali, which is the point, but snatching the intellectual power from Brahmin elite, a Muslim elite, uh, or the court elite, uh, Persian, giving it to the people, uh, opening the minds of the nation uh, to begin to look at, look critically, even at what the British government is doing to trying to establish a Sanskrit college in Calcutta uh, to be able to criticize your rulers and criticize your religious leaders, your intellectual elite. Uh, this is 
uh, the mass movement that creates the uh, create begins to create new India, and uh, we the the church because of corruption of evangelical theology, uh, the church has marginalized itself in India, uh, having started all the great colleges, having started all the great schools. Um, the church has marginalized itself, and our seminaries movement, uh, mo uh, uh, seminaries are a major problem in giving us mediocre leadership in India. So we are critics who are questioning uh, the established leadership and the pattern of the last 50, 60 years, 70 years since World War II and the direction in which uh, the church has gone, but with your participation, <coughs> uh, this will uh, this will help change. So the people today who control resources, they're not on our sides uh, because they they realize uh, that we are doing something which is not what uh, the elite necessarily want. So. I mean, to say in Sirampur University that William Carey is the father of modern India I would upset Sirampur Senate uh, because the, some of them know church history. They don't know Indian history. They don't know Bengal's history, even though they are living in Bengal. So uh, uh, there is the you know, whole tradition uh, that we are seeking to change. And this India research movement is a grassroots movement. Uh, which has begun without any resources. Nobody's paid anything, uh, but we praise God that uh, this movement is growing and these 10-part series, which the Lord has opened up, we, we actually need uh, 50 videos of uh, one hour each. So we need real documentarians uh, who will not sit in a studio to make the films, but go on location to actually film about what the Bible has done for medicine, for agriculture, for languages, etc. So we need a lot of documentarians and they will come. But this uh, invitation from the Lord to make a 10 part series and the studio is costly. It's costing uh, 1500 pounds a day for five days. Um, um, other than our expenses, that's just what the studio is charging. But uh, we are grateful that this has come about. And if we are able to promote those, that 10 part series, it will become a, fun, a trigger, a catalyst for the kind of thing that is happening on YouTube right now with lots of uh, uh, shows coming up. So I'll just make those general comments, appreciating the help of so many of you are giving. and. Um, praying that this will become a whole movement, that we need better researchers, better writers, editors, um, and uh, particularly documentarians, but also the media savvy uh, people who will turn some of this material into bite-sized, uh, uh, digestible uh, shows, one minute, 30 seconds, and that we have not yet uh, come to. But thank you for, for your help. The, in, I'm, I might just mention today that uh, while I'm this afternoon filming a lecture for Kona Hawaiian development, uh, my other job is to write this, submit a proposal for a, an encyclopedia. We need a Christian encyclopedia, uh, as Dr. Alexander has published in chapter in our book, the third education revolution, that encyclopedia was a Protestant idea, but um, the European Protestant and Roman Catholic Church, they fought with, with each other, exhausted themselves, and they could not take up that work to, to uh, put all the knowledge together. So uh, today I'm uh, supposed to submit a first application for a startup money, uh, to launch this encyclopedia. So I appreciate your prayer. But that work, encyclopedia and building a network of, global network of Christian scholars will need your help. Um, 
in promoting that uh, because this is part of a renaissance of the Christian mind. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vishal, uh, for your final closing uh, conclusion and comments. Thank you all for joining, especially uh, people who asked the questions and comments for the first time. Barnabas, Dr. Aniket, Uday, Prem, uh, a lot of you uh, are joining for the first time and uh, asking uh, wonderful uh, comments. I will invite uh, you know, uh, Barnabas. Uh, would you like to close in prayer? Brother Barnabas, please. Um, let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we just thank you um, and praise you for giving us this opportunity to gather together as your children to, to discuss the impact of your word your, in this world that you've created for us. Thank you so much for uh, the wisdom and experience you've given Dr. Vishal Madhavwadi, the incredible work he's done, uh, all his experiences in his life to bring transformation to listeners, readers of his books. And I pray, Father, that, that this will be a start. It will be a start for something wonderful, uh, something big, uh, even as we have to gather the harvest before you return. I pray, Father, that you will anoint each one of us here, uh, that we will go forward, we will do much more than we can by ourselves because our efforts without you is nothing. But with you, we can change the world. You use disciples, fishermen, to change the world. You can definitely use us. So we submit and surrender our lives to you. Uh, we ask you that you go with us. Uh, speak to us during this week and uh, guide us in the ways that we need to uh, so that we can be a blessing, that we can bring the word uh, the nuances, the intellectual arguments, and we will bring down all things that are raised up against the knowledge of Christ and of the Word and of you, Lord. Empower us with your Holy Spirit and give us your wisdom that we may do this in all humility. And to that alone, we submit and surrender. We ask all this.